Hi, I'm Meredith Vieira, and I just had a great conversation with Kara. She is fantastic. I opened up my heart to her. We had such a good time. I kind of don't want to leave because she's like a new girlfriend. I hope you listen. It was, it was so much fun spending time with her. Hi friends, this is Kara. Welcome back to Really Famous, where you get to know your favorite celebs on a super intimate level like never before because I was a therapist. So that's just how it goes. Right now you are about to get to know Meredith Vieira on a totally personal level. Yes, you probably know her to some degree now because she's been all over TV, The View, to the Today Show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, everywhere. But you don't know her like you're going to get to know her in this talk. This is the real Meredith Vieira. At least I think it is. You let me know what you think by dropping a comment during our talk. It's as important as anything, who you surround yourself with. I just want positivity around me and not, not I mean, I, I don't mind helpful criticism, but I don't want people who are going to bring me down or see the light the world in ways that just are really negative. Mm -hmm. so, and I like that fun. At the end of the day, I want to know that I just had fun doing what I do. Yeah. And you must, I mean, you've been exposed to all kinds of people over the years and had to work closely with all kinds. So what do you do when you're stuck with, with somebody or with a team or people who are kind of negative and the opposite of what you like? Well, you know, I try to uh, not really put on my therapist hat, but try to get it into their minds because usually when people are really negative, there's some reason um, behind it. I try to use psychology a bit to figure out what it is that presses those buttons in them mm -hmm. and and make the experience as positive as I can for myself and for that person. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't so much. But in my business, um, there's so much turnaround. And, you know, when you're working day to day as a journalist, you always had different teams. And so when I was able to build my own, I made sure that the people that I selected um, fit my mindset. Yeah, that makes sense. That's true that with the psychology of it, you're spot on because it's always, it's not you, it's them usually. There's a reason for it, but it may right. be that you, there's something in their past that also maybe you bring something out in them that has to do with something that has nothing to do with you. Exactly, exactly. And it's really important to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, mm -hmm. I, I once did an interview with a, an actor who was my hero. I, I, I couldn't believe I was meeting this person and he was so obnoxious. It was, it was a, a movie junket. And I was, I, I said to my husband, when I got home, I said, I wish I'd never met him because I had this whole other persona in my mind of who this guy is, was whatever. And it didn't match up at all. And Richard said to me at the, at the time, and I think he was so wise. He said, well, what kind of a day do you think he was having? Which interview was this for him on a junket that probably he doesn't want to be on, but he has to be. And so he's, you know, he just sort of that, that um, uh, Atticus Finch walk in someone else's shoes. Totally. Uh, the comparison isn't really fair between, uh, you know, to kill yeah. a mockingbird in this experience, but it really is true that sometimes, if, that, like I said, if you can get into their head, then you can um, feel an empathy towards them instead of feeling a resentment or feeling annoyed. Go, okay, that, uh, I think I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. It didn't help that interview because I didn't come to that realization <laughs> until that was done. But I, I was able to like look at the guy when he was in a movie and go, okay, you know, right. I don't know what what caused that, but I still think he's a great actor. Right. I'm surprised you were doing uh, movie junkets too, because I know they hate movie junkets, right? Those are like the worst. There are very few actors who actually enjoy the junket because well, for everybody who doesn't know, it's five minutes or less with a different journalist, and it's the same question over and over and over, over again. and over and over again. And I think a lot of times they will either want to say, you know, why can't you be a little more crazy? I've done junkets and I, I'm so impressed by journalists who think outside of the box and don't ask the same thing mm -hmm. uh, because that's just lazy reporting. You can always come to no matter where, where you are um, and whomever you're interviewing, you can always come at it with a fresh angle if you're smart and you do your homework. So I, I get why there would be frustration, even though I thought I was doing a wonderful job. At the sure. time. I think this is not, I'm not asking the typical questions, but um, what I was on West 57th, that was one of my incarnations. Yeah. And we did celebrity interviews every once in a while, long form, like 60 minutes would do. And this guy, because he was so famous, I got to do the profile, but he did not want to go do a sit down. He didn't want to spend any time with this. So the agreement was I would get that time with him during this jungle. That's how I ended up on it. Uh, oh, 
that's not the same at all. It's not the same. But in his head, you know, I was whatever number I was. I think I might have been the last person of the day because they were going to give me like five minutes more, which still amounted to like a 10 minute or 15 minute interview. Yeah. Not really a, a difficult to build a whole profile around, but you take what you can get sometimes. Yeah. And uh, so and I'm not even sure that when he walked in that room, he knew that that's what that was. You know, or it was just one. You know, I think that I don't know when I've done them. I look down the list. OK, I've got this, 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 this. And occasionally a, a reporter will be asking the questions that have nothing to do with the movie. And they've sort of um, been able to get in and do that. And that's fine. But I'm not necessarily aware of it. So that could have been the situation with him. I don't know. Right. Right. It's always so interesting. You never know what you're going to get right with an interview. No, exactly. That's kind of the fun thing about it, I guess. But I know what you mean. Like, I always want people to look at me and think of me as me, not just a number, like you're saying. And exactly. Like, I'll do everything I can to make it clear that I'm, no, I'm really interested in you. Like, I'm not just going to ask these same questions so that I can just have that little sound bite that whatever. Yeah, and you want to like. ingratiate yourself immediately. Yeah. Instantly, you want to be somebody in a non-antagonistic non interview, obviously, you want to be somebody's friend and confidant so they feel comfortable really sharing um, themselves with you uh, as best they can, but that's a two-way street. And if the other person has a barriers up, it's tough. You have yeah. to sort of chip away at those walls and you know, you're not always successful. That's absolutely true. So you have interviewed everybody, I'm sure. So I really can't even believe when I think about all of the outlets that you- Sorry, it's my oh, cat. Yeah. Oh, is that your cat? Do you wanna yeah. like um, I don't, hold I can't... her up or him up? She won't. She's acting up. Oh, okay. She hopefully she'll. We're pet friendly. It's okay. I've had my oh, dog yeah, yeah. crash the interviews plenty. Oh yeah, no, she's crashed interviews. I just did uh, the talk recently, and uh, mm -hmm. well, last year, but late in the year, and I'm sitting there, and suddenly she's on my lap, and it was fine. But it's yeah. the, sometimes she she'll cry for attention, and but that's I think she's fine. So are you? I'm sorry. You're are you happy to do these, like to be interviewed as much as I know you do love interviewing and being on air with your story? So how do you feel about being on this side of it? I mean, you seem so comfortable and natural with it. Well, it's it's funny that I, I'm a very shy person, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not, people who knew me as a kid would never have thought I'd end up in the field that I'm in interviewing folks. Uh, but but it, for me, it almost became therapeutic in the sense that it got me out of my shell because when you're interviewing somebody else, you, you, you're not the subject yourself, but you're drawing another human being out. Uh, and I, that's what I really love about it. So when I'm interviewed, I've done it so many times that I've, I've gained a certain uh, amount of confidence and I'm a little bit more comfortable with, the, with being on the other side, but it, it takes a little bit for me. I'm not defensive and I'm not um, nervous, but when you're in the public eye, so many things can get distorted that you say, little snippets of things. Yeah. and I. And I hate that I even worry about that. And it never stops me from doing an interview. And I, you know, my, sometimes uh, somebody that knows me will say, you gotta just not say so much, you know, because I get caught up in it and that's kind of who I am. But um, so I, I have a love hate with being interviewed, but you're very easy to talk to. Oh, thanks. Well, that, I mean, I just have a regular conversation. So you're not, I'm not going to get you or whatever with something, you know, you're yeah. not going to take something you say. And then no, usually it, it isn't the interviewer. It's somebody else who pulls it. Right. You know? Yeah. Right. That's true. But I do think about that too, sometimes with people that I can understand that when they come into an interview with me, how do they, how can they trust me? So even if they feel it from me, which I'm totally authentic, genuine, but even if they might feel it, they can't be a hundred percent sure, I guess. And a right. lot of people have been screwed before for exactly right. that reason. So I do get that. I had a, I actually interviewed, um, I interviewed Spike Lee once for the Sunday routine. And I remember when I got there, I felt like he didn't want me to be there. Oh, he did not want to be doing the interview at all. And I remember thinking to myself after, like to him, I was the New York times. So, I represented all of that. I wasn't just Kara Mayer Robinson. Yes. I was the New York Times. And so when you walk into somebody's house or whatever office or you know get on the Zoom call with somebody, you do also have to understand that there are so many other things that are on their brain that you represent. So it's complicated. It is complicated. On the other hand, when I was with the Today Show, um, we would get celebrities on and you know they're coming on to promote usually. That's why yep. they're on. And they would just sort of mope around and they would be kind of just 
half-assed about the interview and the whole, and I would I wanted to say to them you're a freaking actor act at least act like you're interested yes. because uh, you know this is more for you than for me honey you're here to promote your film and you're boring and I and that to me is a, you know if you're going to be in, on this side you put on the put on the, the your big boy pants and and behave you know just deliver yeah, I'm with you too. By the way, I just I feel like you almost just said what I posted on Instagram the other day. I had this whole post about I used to be shy as a kid, like a super shy. And then I came out of my shell a little as I grew up. But then it's really having this show that has turned me into like an extrovert now. It's bizarre. My <laughs> parents will be like, we don't even know what happened. Who are like you? <laughs> I'm like the most talkative person at the dinner table now, you know, so, but I do think you're exactly right that it is interesting that you, by being on the other end of it, you do learn those, how to be that other way. It's so interesting. But, you know, it's funny when I started in journalism, um, you know, I started locally, but then I went, my first job network was CBS News. And you had a handbook that you had to memorize before you start. I don't think that even exists anymore. There were so many rules that had to be followed. And what one of the primary ones was that you never allow yourself to be the story. It's never about you. This is back in the days where you never even saw me on camera, right. very rarely. And, and that fit into my personality, actually, because I did get out in the field. I met people, which helped me um, get over my shyness, but I didn't have to be showcased. And that was great. I didn't want to be. Then The View came along and I was thinking, I don't know if I want to do this. This is where I have to actually talk, you know, and have opinions. And I, I was trained for years not to have opinions. So here I am, you know, to just give the news lady, just the facts. And I became like an unleashed animal. It's like I was let out of a cage. And I was saying crazy stuff just because I could say it. Um, so I had to learn to rein myself in a little bit just because I, I, I was nervous to do it, but I sort of got a kick out of it too. That's so interesting. So were you scared leading up to it? Like, so what happened? Did Barbara Walters ask you, say, like, let's do this together? Or what? how did this start but and no, what were your thoughts? I had been at um, the evening news and then I was, I did uh, West 57th. And then I, right after my son was born or while I was still pregnant, when I went off for maternity leave, I was offered the job at 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. And so I went to 60 Minutes and it, it's kind of a long story. You know, I, I had my son, Ben, started working at 60, and it was very much an, uh, an all-boys club, a boys club. And I found it um, a lot of pressure. Uh, and you, if you were not in Don's office sort of performing, quote unquote, what was wrong with you? And I had learned how, by having a kid, I knew how to um, time manage pretty well because you have to. So I would do my writing late at night, and I worked with my producers. If I had a story that would take five days, we did it in two days. I just did a lot of interviews just to, so I have more time at home. And I think that that rubbed Don the wrong way. And I've made my peace with Don. So this is not anti Don Hewitt at all. He's a genius, but I think my baby was Ben. His baby was the show and we were butting heads a lot. And then I got pregnant with my second son, Gabe, and that was the handwriting on the wall. So I, I left 60 and I, I did, um, early, early morning news with um, John Roberts, who's now at CNN. Actually, he had just come out from Canada and we did the, the show together and I couldn't, I'm not a morning person, go figure. Um, but because I've done morning show right. stuff, but um, I just couldn't stand it. I, and nothing about John, it was just exhausting. I was at work by 2.30 in the morning and I just had no life, it was awful. And then I, I think I kind of planned getting pregnant. I, I, I didn't, but I did somewhere in my, in my subconscious because I was pregnant with Lily. Uh -huh. And then when I had Lily, I left. I, that was it. I didn't want to do that anymore. And then I got offered a job at ABC at a show called Turning Point, which was long form with a, a, a wonderful woman named Phyllis. I'm, I'm blanking on her last name now. I, I'm sorry to say that. That's terrible. But she, she got me. And I said, I don't know if I want to go back and do that because I want to do my writing at home. And she said, you can do your writing in your bathroom. All I need for you, I just, I really like what you do. Um, if you could, you figure out what, however works for you. If you never want to come into an office, you don't have to come into an office. And I delivered for her probably 120% because now it was me proving that I could do that. And she let me, she said, I, I trust you to deliver. And I really enjoyed that. And then um, that when, oh, when I was there, it was the show was sort of fizzling out. 
and Arbor Walters knew Phyllis and knew Betsy West, who was also one of the top people at, at our show. And she was looking for somebody to be the moderator for this new show she had come up with, this talk show, um, with all these gener different generations of women. Yeah. And she contacted them and said, well, I think she's very good, but this is to Betsy and, and um, Phyllis, to, but is she funny? And they said, well, she's crazy. <laughs> she's um, silly, but yeah, she's very funny. I just lost an earring. Cue funny. Oh. Um, <laughs> that is funny, look at you. Your uh, timing is impeccable. Now. Exactly, the clown that I am. And so she asked me to audition, Barbara, and I did uh, in the hotel room in Manhattan. That's where they held all the auditions. And I went begrudgingly. I don't really watch morning television, nothing against it at all, but I was working. So, and I, I was a little bit of, well, you know, I'm a journalist. I don't know that I really want to do that. And again, Richard, who's very level-headed, he said, look, you're a reporter who doesn't really want to go out and report anymore because if I had little kids, I didn't right. want to be on the road. Uh, he said, so why don't you just, it's an audition, you know, just go and, and maybe it'll open your eyes to something else, to other possibilities. And so I went and I sat in this hotel room with Barbara. The first group was Barbara, Star Jones, I, I think it was Joy and Debbie. Um, and I loved it. It was so weird. I loved it. And I came home and I said, you know, I said to Richard, I, 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 can't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I really enjoyed it. And I said, but I'm never going to get it. There were so many people. I'm never going to get it. And then I got it. Oh, and so that was you it. You loved it right from the audition. You loved it. Yeah, I knew that it was, I, I'm big on change. Um, and yet I'm not at all. <laughs> but okay. but I, I like to shake stuff up. And I knew that my husband was right in the sense that I, uh, I didn't, I loved what I did, but I didn't want to do it. You know, I, I didn't want to be on the road. And this was an opportunity to try something different. And I've also always believed in this business. And maybe it's being a woman, but I felt the more skills you have, the greater your skill set, the more likely you'll have longevity. So, you know, I knew I could as a journalist, I could tell stories. This was something else. Okay, I could do, can I do talk? And so I jumped at it and I, I don't regret it at all. I spent 11, nine years there and grew tremendously and had wonderful experiences. Um, at the end of the day, I'm not sure that's the perfect format for me. I don't know if there is a perfect format for me, but it was a great experience. It was great to work with Barbara and to get to oh, know the other women. And, and also when you start something from the ground at up, building up, there's a camaraderie uh, when you're in the trenches that you don't have if you just walk into another show. It's just different. You're all in it together. You're all fighting to get uh, the show uh, off the ground. I had that with West, West 57th as well, the yeah. show that I did before, 60 Minutes. And, and there's something very, there's a bond that you create that is very special. And then when the um, game show came around, Millionaire, and I was offered that, um, I thought, oh, okay, I like Millionaire. I, I why not? People yeah. said, to you, said to me, why would you do a game show? And I said, well, I, I like game shows. What's wrong with game shows? And, and that was Regis's show, you know, that he didn't mm -hmm. want to, the only reason I got it was he didn't want to do syndication. He had done the prime time and he uh -huh. wasn't interested in doing syndication. Although they would have given it to him. And, and I'm so glad that I adored doing that. That was so much fun. I did that for 11 years. Yeah. And also with today's show at, for a few of those years as well. Five well, of those years. There isn't a, I mean, doesn't, there doesn't have to be a perfect format because you like change and you like exactly. all of these. So that's like the best of both worlds to be, I mean, to go from 60 Minutes. So you were the youngest reporter at the time, right? On 60 Minutes? Yes. That's yes. major. I just read uh, Katie Couric's book. Did you read it? Uh -huh. I did not. I don't, and I'm sorry about, oh, come all good. On, honey. It's okay. That's sweet pea for those who wonder. Um, I don't, I'm not really interested, this is nothing about Katie, in industry books. I'm in the industry, so yeah. I don't particularly gravitate toward them. Um, I got it. So no, I didn't, but I saw a lot of clips, whether fair or not, you know, clips are, it's like taking a part of an interview and focusing on that. Exactly. But I, that's, I saw that. Exactly. But, but like, tell me I'm what not... you were going to say. Yeah. yeah. So she did say, I mean, she did say it was tough, especially at like an old boys club, like you were talking about. I know that she said in the book that it was, it was tough. And that was her dream, yeah. of course, to get to 60 minutes. Um, but yeah, so that's major. And then just to, to, to go from there and all the other, I just have to get back to Barbara Walters again. So yeah, sure. Barbara is like, 
a total icon. I remember trying to get her to book her for the New York Times Sunday routine. I wanted to talk to her so bad. I was like, oh, that'd be so good. I couldn't get her. I just couldn't, I didn't even really have a contact who, who worked with her. So I guess I gave up on that, but was she amazing? Like, what was she like? Um, yeah. <laughs> Wait, first, let's take a break. So this is Sweet Pea, right? Did you say Sweet Pea? That's Sweet Pea, yes. So my best friend who I grew up with, her cat, her, my name, her name is Sharon Velasquez, and her cat's name was Sweet Pea, and she lived to like 18 or something like that. Oh, well, she's 17 now, oh. so she and her brother, Felipe, um, are, yeah, just almost 17. Yeah. Cute. So, yeah, we had a dog, Jasper, who I love, and he passed away in November, and you, you know, you reach that point with your pets where you know... I mean, it's amazing that my animals are my my buddies, my companions are as old as they are and doing well. But it's that's the hard part about having pets, you know, yeah. saying goodbye. But but anyway, I didn't mean to digress into that. No, but. I know it's heartbreaking, though. I know it's like, oh, I just I think about when my uh, another dog I had died. It was like, seriously, it was just it's crushing. So I, I yeah. totally understand. I'm sorry about Jasper. No, well, thank you. Well, he died in my arms, which is, oh. I can't ask for more than that. Yeah. And he lived a good life, right? Did he, he lived a very good life. Yeah, okay. he was waiting for me that morning, November 1st. He was at the bottom of the staircase and he never did that. And I just knew. And we just sat there. But you know, it was the most amazing thing. Um, he had started to have some seizures and he was having a seizure. And, and I just knew this one was different. And I'm holding him. And my two cats came up to him and sat at his head, like sentries, and they did not leave him until he passed away. They sat there for one hour. It was unbelievable. It was like, we are going to be here for you. It was, I get emotional when I think about it because I, you know, at such a difficult time, it was actually beautiful. It was like, they knew, yeah. they knew. It's, they're smart, yeah. those, those buggers. <laughs> it's, uh, no, animals or something about their, their yeah. sense that they have. It's like, it's, you know, not like. It's I, nothing I, we have. Yeah. No. It's beyond no. that. It's beyond that. So. But it's nice that you can look back and think of it as beautiful. Cause yeah, it was, absolutely. And that's life. Yeah. And that's life at the end of the day, that is life. So that's a part of it. And I mean, he was ushered into his new world by his best friends, you know. That's sweet. And sad. Yeah. Um, okay, so we were, we were talking Barbara, about Barbara. Back to Barbara. Barbara. Barbara nice, that's nice, a, that's a difficult like... segue from Barbara. Well, I'll go to my dead dog and now Barbara. <laughs> yeah. I bet so if anybody is... could do it, it's you. Let's say, how about you. What would your segue be? <laughs> I, I, I am another old bitch. <laughs> you know, she, Barbara, you know, Barbara would love it. She's Barbara Walters. You, you mean she's really smart and she's tough 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 and talk about whatever katie says about the difficulty in the business or i say pales in comparison to what Bar barbara was the trailblazer mm -hmm. she faced much more than i ever did and i'm not even gonna speak for katie but certainly much more than i ever did and she had a stick to about her and she was gonna do it and she was not taking no for an answer and even when i mean when she was with harry reasoner those were dark days when she was anchoring with him he was not nice to her she didn't get the backing of the network that she deserved, um, but she and she ended up being let go from that show, you know, um, but she didn't give up. And I think she re rediscovered herself or they rediscovered her when she started doing long interviews oh. and made a name for herself. So by the time, obviously, The View came on, she's an icon beyond right. icons. Uh, but I didn't know if you if you wanted to hear a really filthy joke give her a martini she she had the most incredibly um and i don't mean in a bad way because she's such a classy lady yeah but she could tell it and i think it may be because her dad was a nightclub owner she was around that whole environment she, that's where she was raised really and so she knew she knew how to deliver a line she knew timing she uh and because it came out of her mouth it was like oh my god you know, wow, I just heard the most amazing joke from Barbara that I can't even repeat. But that was was part of her charm, that she's mm -hmm. a complicated person. And I could see why she wouldn't want to be interviewed by you, because she was also private oh. and very shy as well, but very, very private. She had a persona, and she yeah. didn't really like people seeing behind that. 
That makes sense. And that's also yeah. like you were saying before, that's more of what it was then. It was like you nobody really needed to or wanted to hear or you weren't supposed to hear from the people who were telling the story. Right. So right. but even when she did the long form interview, you would get a sense of her, but it, like you said, it was her persona, I suppose. And the view we probably saw a little bit more of her there. But right. I see what, what you're saying that and right, even if whatever she shows to the world, she doesn't necessarily want to show everybody everything. Um right. And that's interesting too. So it's like you, how she didn't realize until she was doing these uh, this other format that it was really her thing too. Not that not that reporting wasn't her thing, but these long form interviews. Like how interesting that she went a long time without even doing those, right? Yeah, I don't think she was given given the opportunity. Yeah. But then when she did them, she was able to get people to say things that nobody else had because they i mean you know she talks about sort of i don't think she had an affair with fidel castro but you know they were flirting with her. she really got people to uh speak you know to uh -huh. share things they hadn't with others and she could be very flirtatious um she knew how to work it essentially she knew how to yeah. work it and 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 get those questions in where you went well, wait a minute what did she just ask me what did i just answer and then she's uh -huh. on to the next thing she was good at it she was really, really good at it. But she was also a taskmaster. When you were on The View, she didn't like something you knew about it. Because, you know, that's what had happened to her when she started. She she really believed you got to toughen up. Mm. That was part of the part of the deal. So she could be she could be hard. Um, but I get it. I get yeah. it. She expected from everybody what she delivered. Mm -hmm. And if you were not professional, if you didn't know your stuff, um, you know that she uh, knew about it. Either well, she would tell you or she'd tell the producers. That's uh, unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, so then the producers would have to tell. Sometimes, you. or or they might say she she would call you in if she was pissed about something. But but that's okay. I, I, I you know I well this this running thing about when a woman does it she's a bitch when a man uh -huh. does it he's you know right. a, a leader you know yeah. but. Um, so she was up against a little bit of that, but she she um, she was always also ultimately a lady. She I remember she I had sort of been doing this anyway, but she every person new person she would meet who'd be part of the show, you know, like a co-host or whatever. She, one of her biggest pieces of advice was always write letters. Don't just jot down something in an email. If you want to tell somebody thank you or you want to share something, always write a letter. It's important. It was that old school way of yeah. doing things. And to this day, that's what I do. Wait, so who do you and write And I think she's right. From? Well, if somebody, if a friend does something for me, or uh -huh. when I was on, for example, when I was on um, Millionaire, one of the rules was you were never allowed to meet the person before or ever see them after. So you had Wait, that- Wait, or ever see them after? Yeah. you not. I mean, you might run into them, but- that was just a rule that you had this moment. And I think it was for legal reasons. Okay. I don't know why the after, but I know. So why would you see them after they were people from all over the country who came in and then they leave and you're on to the next contestant. Sure. So I always felt bad because people would lose and I didn't get to say, I'm sorry or anything. I just just say, you know, goodbye. And good night. so I, I wrote everybody a note, everybody, uh -huh. every contestant. Or I just said, I thank you for coming. And I make a comment about how great they were or make them feel better if they bombed out or a joke or whatever it was, just so they knew that I appreciated them and that without them, we wouldn't have a show. And that's the kind of thing I think Barbara would have done. Uh -huh. It's, I love it's not that. a big deal, but yeah. it's a, and it just shows that you care about it, that sometimes people who host shows would think they're the show and they're not the show. I mean, sometimes they are, but the shows that I've done, you're not the show. The show is the show and you're a vehicle. And it, certainly in a game show, as Alex Trebek said many times, uh, it's about the game. It's not about you. And once you make it about you, you're destroying the, the whole nature, the whole construct. So um, I was very aware of that. And I wanted those contestants to know that they were the key to the show, not me. Yeah. I was just a little troublemaker. Making them feel nervous. Well, making them feel good, though, probably. Yeah, so yeah. They probably yeah, felt very probably. comfortable when they saw you sitting there across from them, like, yeah. okay, it's Meredith Fear. I can, I'm, okay. I'm going to be okay. Well, I also knew how to tease people because the most important thing you can do with someone on a show, a game show, is relax them 
Yeah. Because people are so nervous and they will not do well if they're nervous. And they're there. I would tell them, you know, you're here because you pass that test. You're already, you don't have to worry about the uh -huh. game. You just have to relax. And usually if I did a little teasing with them, they would laugh and it was like a relief, you know, the, a little bit of the pressure was off. Yeah. They can breathe, take a breath and then actually yeah. think about yeah. whatever the question exactly. is. Exactly. Exactly. Because I always, it wasn't my money. I wanted every single person to win a million dollars. Sure. You know, I wasn't giving it out. <laughs> So the thank yous, let me get back to that for a second. Yeah, I yeah. think that I love that idea of a thank you. And I think that especially today, even though an email thank you is easy, I feel like people are so busy and getting onto the next thing that they don't even really give much thought to thank yous. And I personally think they're so easy and they make such a difference. Like if I get a thank you from somebody and it's not that often really, it really makes my day. And I just think it's, the, these are the little easy things that have fallen by the wayside, I think over time. I mean, do you remember growing up, if you got gifts or birthday gifts or something, you know, your parents probably made you write the notes. Absolutely. I so, got the stationery every year at Christmas yeah. just for that reason. Now, now go in your room and write to Nana, write to this, blah, 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 blah. Sure. Exactly. And that, I mean, it's, it's called, um, what is it called? Etiquette, I guess. Yeah, just, it is. And it it's is. part of growing up, at least when I was a little kid, it was part of growing up. And I'm not, I don't mean to belittle the email, thank you. I think that's great, too. I also think it's great sometimes to just, and Bob Saget's passing reminded me of this, but you know, that one of the things they said about him is he never missed an opportunity to tell a friend that he loved them or a stranger. I like what you're, what you're wearing or whatever. He, he passed kindness along uh -huh. so grace, graciously, knowing that that triggers more kindness. And I think it's so easy when I walk by somebody in the street, if I think they're having a bad day, now, I don't do it like a stalker, but I'll say, or I'm in a store, I'll say, Oh, you're that scarf's gorgeous. Yeah. And, and, and it perks them up, you know, and I, I'm not saying it disingenuously. I'm saying yeah. it because I think it's pretty. And you, you know what? You may need to know that today. You may Definitely. need a little because I need it. So I, I, I assume I'm pretty much like everybody else. And so why wouldn't they need it? Yeah. So if it registers for you, say it out loud. Exactly. Why not? I exactly. love that. I think yeah. if everybody should do that. And then look, the, everything, the whole world would just feels so much better. It's not really exactly right now. Right boy, now. do we need it too. So that's for sure. So yeah. Barbara, do you ever talk to her? Like, does anybody talk to her? I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. I do not talk to her. I mean, when she left the, the view, she didn't disappear, but I think she wanted her space. Um, and I respect that. And I reached out to, at one point with the other, the girls mm -hmm. to have lunch and that just never materialized. And I'm not sure the state of her health right now. I hope that she's doing well, um, but I, I don't really know. Yeah, yeah. And how was your relationship with Regis? Or did it, you have one? It was one? great. Yeah, I did. I didn't have like, we go out to dinner type thing. I don't have any friends on that level. That's not my thing. Wait, wait, wait um, back up. You don't have any okay. friends that are in celebrity? show business or any? Oh no, I have friends. I have oh, okay. friends. No, 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 I have friends. Oh God. I meant go to dinner with level. Turn. Oh yeah, right. Um, no, I do like, I, you know, I'm friendly with the, the, the people, the people on today and stuff like that. But okay. my world is very much work and then home. And I have a lot of work friends, but I tend when I go home and especially when my kids were around, I switched gears Yeah. and my focus was home and, and I wasn't a big person to go out a lot anyway. Um, but it's very funny. I'm, I'm going to digress for a second. I did an uh, interview years ago with a magazine. I'm, I'm not going to say which one, but they were profiling me. And so blah, blah, blah. And she's, I think I was, I think I was, I started millionaire, but I don't even remember. But I already had a career, you know, and uh, they finished interviewing me and they said, well, can we have the names of some of your friends? We'd love to interview them. I said, sure, um, Priscilla and Bobsy. And they said, what, who were they? I said, oh, I went to high school with them. They're great. We see each other all the time. They said, well, no, we met somebody. Oh. You know, I don't. I think I don't think they wanted to say important, as opposed mm -hmm. to my friends are not important. But I got it. Famous. I got exactly what they meant. Yeah, famous. And I said, yeah, no, I have friends in the business, but not if you're talking friends uh -huh. that I confide in. I have a a very small group that I've known almost all of them. I've known since I was two years old. I went to an all girls school and I got to, and that was where my bonding took place. And we've stayed friends and some were middle school and some were high school, far fewer in college. And they're the people that no matter how, if I don't see them 
again, everybody says this, but it's true. If I don't see them for years, we pick up right where we left off. We're there for each other. Mm -hmm. We get each other. We don't care. I mean, we're interested in each one's journey through life, but we don't attach more significance to one person than another, yeah. particularly based on what they did. Um, because you know how fleeting that is. It just, and usually it's smoke and mirrors, a lot of it. It's, it's a big build so? up to nothing. I think in my business, people like to make a big deal out of it. And, and I, I don't know. There's something about stardom that I think is off-putting to me. And I, look, I can get as starry-eyed as anybody else, but I, I, I just think it's the emphasis is wrong, uh -huh. that it's uh, creating these stars. But I've always thought it's literally about the work and not about that idolizing somebody. And now it's so prevalent with, um, uh, what do you call it, all these TikTok things and these instant stars and, you know, God love them. They're making a lot of money and whatever it is, but I, there's something about it that depresses me. I get, right. I just get bummed out. I don't know. Okay. And I also know that it, when they put you on a pedestal, inevitably they're going to knock you off it. So if you buy into it, really buy into it, you're, you could be in for an extremely bad fall. So I'd rather not. Yeah. And that's why my friends my, tend to be my oldest and dearest because they know me and they yeah. won't listen. If I ever said, well, now I'm doing this, they go, yeah, yeah. So what, <laughs> you know, they're just right. good good right. um so, so i would but i wouldn't even do it anyway anyway yeah. so interesting so did you did you feel at any point like you were uh, i mean you were you kind of are on a pedestal though i mean even though it's not phony but for it's for good reason but you certainly are an icon like uh, you know what i mean yourself so you are up there so was i know you're saying people put you on a pedestal and then they're going to try to take you down but you're on the pedestal still. Do you know what I mean? Did, like I do, I do. But I think if, if people, I usually get from people that they admire my work. Uh huh. Um, they don't go like, oh, you know, it's Meredith Vieira. Uh, and and often, especially when I did the Today Show, but it still happens, but less. Uh, people would say to me, "Thank you for getting me through a dark time in my life. Thank you for." Um, bringing laughter into my home. Thank you. It was things that were quite emotional and uh -huh. special to me because it spoke to a human connection as opposed to, oh, you're so, um, you're beautiful or I love right. your clothes, yeah, that, that right. kind of thing. It was, I, you somehow made a connection with me that I needed. Um, when yeah. I was doing the Today Show, we did Virginia Tech. That was one of the first stories I did when there, there was a massacre, there were students. And I went to Virginia Tech with uh, Matt Lauer and the rest of the Today Show. And there was a vigil held that night. And I went to the vigil, not to report on it. I just went to see, to be part of it. Um, and the student came up to me and she recognized me from the Today Show. And she did not live anywhere near Virginia Tech. And she was very, very, very upset. And she went, um, you know, I, I feel like I know you and I need a mom right now. And, and I held her and it was, that was, that's when I thought, my God, the power of what I do, the power to, um, to touch people in that way. Um, that, that's, that's an amazing gift you've been, I've been given that you, I better respect and treat very carefully because it's it's really deep you know so when i when i get that from somebody then then i'm okay on that whatever that pedestal is yeah because it yeah. just means that i'm i've broken through the television in a way definitely and so maybe it is a little bit less of a pedestal yeah because they feel like they know you right and you're comfort you're so comforting that they're not idolizing you i guess yeah sure exactly there are people who do many people who do but that's not what we're talking about no so no. is is your kind of like you said barbara had her persona do you feel like yours you have a persona too or is it like how much of a persona versus you is it i think i am pretty much what you're seeing uh, i'm probably like i said my favorite thing to do i mean i'm shy but to this mm -hmm. day, my favorite thing to do is just walk out of the house and keep walking. And I can walk for hours and hours and hours. I love to be in nature. I love solitude. Mm -hmm. um, it might be because I'm in such a business uh, where you're constantly, I mean, particularly when I was doing talk, 
um, or anything that had to do with audiences or, you know, there's people all around you all day long and that's okay. That's the business. I'm not knocking it. That's what it is. So I think when I'm away from it, I really crave um, just being alone with my own thoughts. Sure. It's constant, I'm sure. And like just yeah. overwhelming where it's right, it's fine, but then you need to step away from it and do something. Exactly. Totally exactly. And so, so you, family is everything for you, it feels like, right? I mean, so is your, your career. I don't mean to say that's not. But good. No, but more family. Yeah, more family, right? I get it. Um, one more career question before we, we, we yeah, yeah. hit the topic of your family. So when you were starting, because you're so successful too, were you, what was it like for you when you were starting out and trying to make it in the business? Well, you know, I think part of it was I never intended to get into the business. Uh-huh. I wasn't one of those people who was like, I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I was a senior in college and I didn't know what I was going to do. I pretty much had every major you could have. The dean of the university brought me in beginning of my senior year and he said, do you want to graduate? <laughs> I went, well, yeah. And he went, well, you better pick a major and stick to it because you're all over the map. And, but I think he liked me as a person. He said, the way I look at it, you have enough credits to graduate with English. So you're going with English. So I went, <laughs> okay, I'm graduating with English major. Wow. And, and um, there was a co- course offered. I went to Tufts university, um, Jackson college, Tufts university. And my senior year in the winter break between January and February, you took courses not for credit. And one of them happened to be broadcast journalism. And I, don't, I, and I could take two. I took that and badminton and with equal interest in both, like not like, oh, whatever. And I, the cast was taught by Les Woodruff, who was a reporter at WEEI in Boston at that point. It, now I think it's sports, but it used to be news station. And he was great. And our last uh, assignment was to create a radio documentary. And we broke into groups of four or five and we all, oh, ours, ours was on redlining and real estate in Boston, how they were keeping minorities out of okay. certain buildings. So we all went out and reported it. We all took turns writing it. And then when it came down to the documentary, there was one voice and my team picked me to be the voice. And so they brought in the head of CBS news in Boston to listen and to critique all these documentaries, radio documentaries. And when they got to ours, at the end of it, he said, mm. he critiqued it. And they said, who's, who is the voice? And I raised my hand. He said, I need to talk to you. I thought, oh, my God. I, I just thought he's going to throw me out of school. I didn't know what was going on. And I go out in the hall. And he says, what are you doing when you graduate? And I said, that's a, <laughs> kind of a tough question. I have no idea. I'd even gone to secretarial school the last summer because my mom said, you're not coming home. You're going to find a job. And, and so I said, I, I don't know. And he went, I know you're going to have a huge career. And he hired me as an intern there. He said, I want you to come intern at CBS. What? CBS and I, what am I? I'm too, I'm too stupid to say, no, I have no idea. What you, you know, I just went, oh, okay, I'll do that. So you, okay. So then you're somebody who says yes to opportunities is I think what I think here. I do. Yes, I think uh-huh. I do. I, I, did. I then I start backpedaling the minute I do it. I go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I remember the Today Show. I said to Richard, I was on a bridge. I wasn't going to jump, but I said I was in a car and a bridge. I said, I can't do this. He said, Heidi, you set yourself up every single time you say yes. And then I have to hear about how you can't do it. But I because I, I like I said, I want change, but I'm so scared of it because I'm yeah. scared of failure or whatever. So. But yeah, I just said yes. In fact, they said to me, come prepared to rip wires your first day at CBS radio. And I thought, you know, wires and radio, wires, electrical wires. So I bought, went out to, I think it was the Gap, and I bought really cute overalls. And I oh. come walking in, and the guys are looking at me like, why are you dressed like that? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm ready to rip wires. I was told to rip wires. He said, no, we meant wires from the wire services, like Reuters and UPI and AP. You go to the machine. They used to have those old machines. I didn't know anything about UPI or whatever it was AP and all. So, but again, I think in a weird way, they found me a little charming. Like, ah, uh-huh. oh, this kid, we're going to help her along. And then I worked my tail off. I worked 10 times harder than anybody because I really wanted to show them I could do it. And I also believe that nine tenths of the game is just working. It's yeah. really working. I don't think there's a free ride. And if there is, you're going to, you know, it could be short-lived, I think, most times. 
Yeah, especially with your journey, there's no way you could have made it through all of these things without being like really kicking ass the whole time. You know what yeah. I mean? Like having to really put in the the work all the way. You can't just show up and no. Do and as it a woman back way. then too, um, boy, did you have to. Uh huh. So you. On the other hand, I. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, on the other hand, I graduated in '75, and it was there was uh, a lot of people were given jobs based on quotas. If you were a woman, if you were a person of color, but and I. When I was in radio, uh, after I finished at Tufts, I eventually got a job in radio as a newsreader on a top 40 station in Worcester. And I, there was a phone call from a, the news director, Arthur Albert in Providence, looking for somebody else, Providence, Rhode Island. And I happened to pick up the phone and again, my voice, he said, oh, what do you do? I said, I'm a newsreader. And he said, would you like to uh, look at Providence as a place to work? And I said, I, I don't know. I mean, I have a job here. And he said, well, come down, let's talk. And I went down and he offered me a job in radio and television. And it was a quota. They needed to fill the shoes. So I said yes, because I saw an opportunity, even though, again, I knew nothing about television, by God. But And then I just learned. I learned and I watched and I had people that I admired in the business and I would watch them while forming my own style. So interesting. What an interesting combo. And it, obviously it worked. So right. So the opportunity came, opportunities have come to you. You recognize them. You say yes to them. And then you go all in on them and you learn and you figure it out and you do it. You go all the way. And that's your. Yeah. yeah. And plus it's not fake it till you make it. But, you know, if you if what I what I honestly learned, Cara, to be honest with you, is that I liked telling stories, all those English classes. I took them for a reason. I liked yeah reading stories and I like telling stories. And as shy as I was, I really am interested in people. I'm interested in their stories. I'm interested in their voices. Um, and and here was this opportunity to do it. Uh, I, I was the slowest typer, it was pathetic. For somebody who took typing, you know, secretarial <laughs> school, so I'd have a job. So my boss at, in Providence was like, oh my God, uh, yeah, I don't think you got it because, yeah, he actually fired me. On a Friday afternoon, he fired me and I went home and I was crying and I told my dad, you know, because I went home to my parents' home. I'm from East Providence. And my dad said, well, do you think you've got it? I said, yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. He said, then why do you care what this guy says? What, there's going to be a million people going to tell you that. If you listen to everybody who tells you that, you're never going to succeed in life. If you believe in yourself, you'll do it. And hard work. My father was a very hard worker. And I went in that Monday and I said to the guy, I said to the news director, I don't care what you say, I am going to succeed. And I think, I don't know if he thought I was going to lose it because I was like a little crazy, but, um, or if he just was disarmed and he said, I'm going to give you another chance. Oh, wow. That yeah. doesn't happen often. No, it doesn't. I know it doesn't. He might've just needed me to be around a little longer because maybe they were short yeah. staff. I have no idea. But we ended up being, I mean, it, it all smoothed out and it was fine. Mm. And then I got the call to be in New York. And that's went. really something yeah. I bet also. So it's interesting, too, because your husband is so accomplished, too, that I feel like there is a winning combination there, too, that it probably helped you and you helped him. You kind of feed off each other, right? That you're both interested in pursuing things and trying new things and opportunities and whatnot. Is that yes? Absolutely. It's a little yin and yang. Yeah. When I would get down on myself or not be sure, he was always there to say, you know, you've done it before, you can do it again. And it's very supportive of everything I've done. You know, some people, the thought that uh, your wife, who was I was, at that point really was the breadwinner in the family at the Today Show, would turn to him and say, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this anymore. I know it's time to go. A lot of people said, no, 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 you're not leaving that job. You know, that's that's a big uh Part of our income um right but he's he's been so supportive of every decision i made and i've been the same with him and although we're both in the business he um he was a producer i was a reporter there's a real difference between as mm -hmm. you know between the two of them he's very political and i'm not particularly i'm interested in issues but i'm not interested in the minutia of politics at all so we were never really in each other's lane like trying to butt each other out you know we were paralleling and i think that helped a lot right. he's also i mean he's the writer of the family he's a great writer 
Right. So that is interesting because there are, right, even though you're familiar with the same, you're kind of in the same industry, the same field, at the same time, it's two very different things. Yeah. But you also, and you're able to have that relationship that you really supports one another and encourages that kind of growth and development, which is exactly a lot of the factors have been there. So he has MS, right? He's had mm -hmm. it. He was diagnosed a long time ago. Yeah, so, when he was 25. Yeah. When he was 25. So that's something that you, you've both been kind of dealing with for a long time. So has that maybe made, made things more challenging, stronger at the same time? Is it kind of a double-edged sword in a way? It's so tough, but... It, it, it is. It, there are days where you think, oh, God, this is just more than you can handle. And then there are days where MS it doesn't even show its face. Uh -huh. um, you know, he is secondary progressive, so it's not like he's totally out of the woods at okay. any particular day. I mean, there's a decline, but he's not. Some people are a very fast decline. Some people are much slower. He's much slower, but it's there. It's real. Um, but, you know, that's, we all have challenges. I knew when I, you know, not long after I met him, he took me to dinner and told me. And one of the reasons he did that was because he had been involved with somebody. And when she found out, she had ditched him. Um, and and I get how that happens. People get very scared. And, and I think he, his feeling was, well, if you're going to go, I'd rather you go now rather than, you know, two years from now or whatever it is. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because my father's a doctor or it just, I knew what MS was. I just didn't. I, it's, it was sort of like, well, we're all, uh, you don't know that tomorrow I could be in a terrible car accident. You know, you know, we don't yeah. know what's around the corner for any of us. And that did, it just didn't matter to me. I knew that it was going to present itself as an issue, something you had to work through, but mm -hmm. I felt like it, it was okay. Uh, yeah. And I, and I really liked him and I just felt that's not going to prevent me from the path. If it's meant to be, it won't, it won't, it won't end because of that. Um, yeah. And then right after that, he took me for one of his checkups and we were in a place, a facility, I think in the Bronx hospital. And the waiting room was full of young men with MS, mostly men, even though it's more pro prominent, prominent with women or prevalent with women. And um, there were people in really rough shape. And I thought, well, you know what? It, it can it can always be worse. It can always be better. Mm -hmm. It is what it is. And, and we've worked through it. I mean, we're, you know, we're fine. I still think he's a jerk, but that's not why I think he's a jerk. You know, I, I told him the day I met him, you're a jerk and I'm going to marry you. And both are still true. <laughs> that's so funny. I mean, because it also, right. I mean, yeah. After this yeah. many years of marriage, there are going to be times you're like, hey, you're such a jerk. I can't handle yeah. you or whatever. <laughs> Nobody, I mean, he was a smart aleck when I met him, but I, oh. I liked that. I oh. liked that. So, but um, we, we've so always challenged each other this way. Yeah, we're totally. It gets him through everything. He's uh, he's very, very, very funny. And I think you have to have a sense of humor, particularly when you're facing illness. Yeah. And he has this great skill um, through writing to get out his feelings. And I think that's also very helpful. In fact, he's written about MS several books. And he, the number one thing he gets from people is thank you for uh, giving me a voice because I haven't been able to articulate how I feel. And you said exactly how I feel. Um, that's kind of why I got involved with this project yeah. on breast cancer. The same thing. It's find your NBC voice. And it was because, well, not, it was partly because my grandmother had uh, metastatic breast cancer when I was a teenager and we never talked about it. I don't think she ever discussed it. And uh, I don't know sure she even understood the ramifications. And that was back in the day where your doctor was a god. You never would have, you know, questioned anything they said. And what I learned through the years uh, and then with Richard is the only way you can empower yourself as a patient is to find a voice. You have to be the center of your treatment plan. You have to be the one who is calling the shots along with your team because ultimately it's your life. So when I had the opportunity to do this breast cancer, I thought, I'm on board. I'm, and I've, I've loved every minute of it. It's yeah. been okay. a great opportunity. I want to ask you some details about that. So it's oh, a new sure. project that you have, right? So it's you're interviewing people about it. Um, and so they can watch videos, correct, of your interviews. Yes. And there's yes. also there, a radio show. Right. It, there's the website is Find Your MBC voice. I always want to say NBC. I've been so trained after so many years of that network. Um, dot com and, and and NBC stands for metastatic breast cancer. 
And if you go to that site, it will direct you to the radio channel if you'd like to listen to mm -hmm. a lot of interviews that we've done. We've done them with, uh, I was doing the interviews along with a doctor and we've interviewed other doctors, oncologists, um, social workers, psychologists, financial experts, all the areas where you might find yourself needing help once you've been given this diagnosis because it is stage four cancer yeah. and there are no cures here at all. Um, but that, at this website that you go to, we give you the tools you need if you've been newly diagnosed to, to find your voice. Um, if we have a discussion um, uh, pamphlet or right, that's not the right word, um, guide, it's, it's discussion okay. guide that shows you all the questions you probably need to ask your doctor at that first visit because people, you're not equipped to, to no, some people might I, know, but most people also, that's the kind of thing that knocks you to the ground yeah. when you hear the, those words. And so it's great to have your little guide there. Um, what do I need to know? I need to know what this diagnosis mm -hmm. is. There are a lot of subtypes of breast cancer. What do I have? What are my treatment options? How do I tell my family? What about my job? What about the psychological components? There's always depression involved and that's a fear, um, sadness, loneliness, all of those things. What about um, just navigating my day to day? What is this gonna cost me in healthcare costs? What if I'm African-American and not Caucasian? There's disparities in healthcare mm -hmm. yeah. and even in diagnosing the disease um, so and treating it. So all of those things, we're, we're trying to help you have the tools you need to be the, the center of your treatment plan because yeah. you need to have a voice in it. And once you have a voice, it's in all these people I've interviewed and they're lovely. They talk about the empowerment that comes with it. They, they go from being scared to feeling mm -hmm. they're in control, as best you can be. They can't control their cancer, but they control the other things around it. And, and it's made them stronger individuals. And that's, and that's why I, I think it's important to have this as a place for people to go. You, there are many pl places where you probably could go, but it's, this is like the, the central warehouse mm -hmm. and we can direct you in all kinds of uh, directions. I think that's key because it's so yeah. it would I imagine it's so overwhelming and you feel would feel so powerless if you get a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. I mean that like you said, it's stage four. So there's no treatment, no cure. Um no treatment, no cure, right? I'm getting that right. There were treatments. But treatments, there are, but no there cure. There is not a cure. And what's interesting about this particular group of people, one of the reasons so many of these patients have gone on to be advocates. That's a big jump from a patient to an advocate. Yeah. It's because in this whole cancer world um, with the pink ribbons, the people that have been pushed to the side are the people with stage four because they're, they're not the story pe they want people to hear. Uh -huh. And this is not knocking the breast cancer community, but you don't want to hear about the ones who may not make it. You want to hear the success stories. Uh, and that's where people think there's hope. So I'm going to donate money to mm. research because these people are going to make it. Meanwhile, there's this whole group of individuals that, hey, they're there, they're fighting every day, they're living every day, and they deserve to be heard. And they deserve more attention to be paid to their treatment. And, and what do you do for those folks? You can't just push them to the side. So they're out there screaming at the top of their lungs that we exist and, and we want you to know who we are. And we want you to know what we face every day. And their families it, it, too, right? And their They're, families, so it's not exactly. just them, but they no. need resources and they need to feel like they, they know what to do. So even if a patient doesn't really, isn't ready to take the reins or whatever, maybe a family member feels like, okay, well, what can I do? And then that would give Absolutely. them all kinds of tools and questions and what can I do? And it's empowering to everybody, right? And that, that site that I mentioned, findyourmdcvoice.com, that's directed at caregivers as much as it, as it is patients and the newly diagnosed because all you want to do as a caregiver is help yeah. and sometimes you don't know what does that mean well how how can i effectively help this person what's what's the best way for me to use my energy and my resources to make a difference in their new life moving forward um definitely so, yeah so all of this right so here's yet another way where you're helping so many people through your uh, relatability, accessibility, like clearly that's your thing is to be able to connect with people. You're interested in them, but you're again, like the, the, the girl who came up to you at Virginia Tech, you know, it's like you're a gift for so many people, which 
I mean, that makes you feel good, right? You know that? Yeah, that it does. But I want, but I would want the same thing, you know? And so that's how I look at it. What if, what if it was me? Yeah. You know? So it's so interesting to me too, because you said a few times, uh, I'm crazy. You said, I think you described yourself as, as that, right? Or wild or something. Yeah, I mean, crazy. kooky. 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 My nickname growing up was so, Gypsy. Yeah, but you seem so like level headed. You seem like you have such perspective on everything. I can't, I don't see that in you, that kooky. Well, I am. <laughs> I mean, I think I can be level headed and I think, you know, I'm a responsible uh-huh. parent and all of that stuff, but I have a little bit of a kooky side. And I think that's what keeps me going. So um, fun. I think it's Is great to be mean? playful. Yeah. Okay. Not that, take yes. yourself seriously. Yes. And, um, Look at life. Look at the silly in life. The silly in life is good. I can't, you can't always be, I would never have succeeded as a journalist. Uh, yeah. If all I did was see the serious, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So that's it would, your secret it would sauce. So beat you down. Yeah. I think it, that's part of it. Cause it's, it's a combination uh, because you have yeah. the, the more, the gravitas, right. And you have the perspective and then you also have the light heartedness, um, that, that all that is per that's a perfect balanced package just like your home it's not always in balance Kara, oh really fair. well like, wait give me an example um well i can go a little bit nutty like i said whenever there's change sometimes i i get right to the edge of thinking what have i done and i, I you know i'm, I'm not going to do anything but i just get go to a place where i'm really scared and then i take the leap you know and it's a good but what leap does that and I, look like what does it look like when you're um, really scared it's really i think it's fear of failure that's what I think you it is or being that. it's yeah. Or, you know, maybe it's that people say the type A personalities um, are always worried they're going to be found out. And I'm somebody who came into the business as a profession without knowing anything. You know, I wasn't the typical, I went to journalism school. I wanted this. I fought mm-hmm. for this. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, just like blinders on what the heck. Yeah. It's, I don't know what I'm going to do anyway, so why not try that? And, and, and it worked out. It just worked out. So every time I have that chance, a part of me, it's uh, the road not taken. Is that it by Robert Frost? Yeah. A part of me always wants to go down the, the road not taken yeah. because that's where life takes interesting turns. That we, that's where you discover things. Don't stay right on the, the well-beaten track. Go somewhere else. Um, but then when you're out there, it gets dark at night, you know, like, well, what path am I on? Because no one else seems to be on it. So you have to really dig deep into yourself and say, I can do this. And if I don't succeed, I mean, I had a talk show for two years and it was canceled. You know, that was tough, um, yeah. but I'd never regret doing it. It was a great experience and I learned from it. And hey, there are going to be dead ends. There are going to be, you know, bumps. There's going to be all sorts of, that's life. And it's what you take away from the experience. I didn't necessarily feel it, feel that the day it was canceled, you know, okay. but, but after two or three wines, it comes to you. <laughs> right. So what did you do the day? Cause again, I'm hearing the great perspective that you have on it now. Yes. You, you figure out how to frame it and, um, adapt and, uh, figure it all out. But what happened that day? Like, what did that feel like? Even if it was just, um, I, it kind of, it is a blur because I tend to wipe those things out. Uh-huh. So I would, I couldn't describe it fully for you, but, um, I could sort of see the handwriting on the wall. There were too many cooks in the kitchen, too many things they wanted to change. And, and that's very much television. If it doesn't, if it's not immediately a hit, um, they, there's something else around the corner. And I felt like, you know, there was a a time when shows would be kept on the air so they could grow and develop. And the Mm. view is a good example. If Barbara Walters had not been on that show, we would have been canceled. They were going to cancel, but it was Barbara. And it's and it wasn't syndication. It was run by ABC, which is a big difference. Syndication doesn't like to take chances. Networks are more likely to take chances. Um, so they kept that show on and look at it now. I mean, what is it, 25 years? So um, so I think part of it in my own head was I was very proud of the work we did. So I kind of chalked it up to, well, it wasn't doing well enough in the ratings to warrant mm-hmm. another year because that's all about the bean counters and stuff like that. And then I came to think, well, you know, d- don't be so high and mighty about it. Uh, maybe there's a reason it wasn't getting as high ratings as something else. Even if you felt it was good, maybe it wasn't connecting with your audience and that's something you gotta accept, you know? I'll never know exactly, but um, 
and it's hard to it's hard to not succeed, especially if you've been successful. Right. So I'm like, wow, what the hell was that? You know, I I didn't anticipate that, but that's the reality of life. That is stuff happens, and I, you know, I lucked into other stuff. I just kept going, and what do you next thing you know, twenty five words or less is around the corner. Yeah. And that, no, that's exactly true. But it's like that thing, I've heard people say this before. It's like, there was so much worry going to like, will I be successful? Can I make it? How can I get there? But it's almost worse when you are successful because like, is this all going to end? Am I going to drop off of this? Is this all going right. to just disappear? But that's where I think my initial thinking, wear as many hats as you can, as many irons in the fire, because if one thing doesn't work, something else might. Mm. And the fact that I can do talk and I can do journalism and I can do um, reporting and I can do game show has been a blessing for me yeah. in the sense that, oh, we can plug her in here or you can plug me in there or I'll do that for you, you know, and I, I even would rip wires out of a wall. I almost did <laughs> yes. my first job, so I'll do it. And, and I think that's made me sellable. And I'm, you know, I'm the first one, actually, when I when um I was offered the job at the Today Show. Um, I went for the ride. Now I'm blank. This is terrible. I'm blanking on his name. Jeff um, took me, picked me up, and he offered me the job. And I said to him, because Katie was leaving, nobody knew, he told me. And I said, aren't you skewing a little old? And he looked at me and he said, no, I'm looking for talent. And, and I think he was like, you shouldn't be saying that. You should be confident. Why are you putting that out in the atmosphere? And he was right. I mean, he didn't say that, but that's kind of what I felt. And, um, you know, sometimes I think, well, I, who's going to hire me now? I'm 68. How long, how much longevity do I have? It's a young person's business, blah, 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 blah. And I have to stop that and go, no, 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 no. As Jeff put it, uh, he's looking for talent and plenty of people are. You, you don't give up. Don't even if, even if age often is a factor, uh -huh. you, you can't let that stop you. I love that. And it's so great that he said that to you because you could very yeah. easily just go back to that and refer to that when you find yourself thinking in that pattern. But I imagine it's so hard because that would be the your natural because so many people are thinking that way, right? Sure. In fact, but my when I was my my um view contract was up when I was invited to do the Today Show. And again, nobody knew that she was yeah. leaving. I knew because the guy told me. And I wasn't signing my contract at The View. And I loved The View. I loved The View. But I, I was looking at, and I didn't want to do morning television, but it was the Today Show. So I'm looking at uh, my options here and my somebody executive at the other network where I was working with The, the View, he said, well, you better sign this because at your age, where else are you going to get a job? Said that out loud. I did not. Um, I could have gone to human resources. I should, maybe I should have, but right. I didn't because I already knew I had just been offered a job. Like the yes. donation. So I played dumb. I said, Oh my God, maybe you're right. I don't know. Jeez. I don't know if I could get another job. I said, but I got to think about it. And then I took the other job. and went, I, that was my cue. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this right. environment. I don't want to be somebody trying to scare me into stuff or belittle me. And I'm, it, maybe he didn't even think what he was saying. I don't know. But at any rate, I took the other job. And then it came out in the newspaper before it was even announced that I had been approached. Because you know how they page six and uh, the post. And uh, he was like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, but it just goes to show, too, like, you can't listen to other people. I no, mean, you can't. Can, right? You have to tune them out, except you do have to listen to people who say something that actually is a really good thing. Like, right. like he told you that time, like Jeff told you, right, Jeff? Is that yeah. what you said? Yeah, yeah. But it's like that. You have to listen to, when you hear a nugget like that, you keep that nugget. But you also have to know, I'm not, no, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to you. You have to know when to do that, right? But that's not always easy. If I hadn't had a job offering, I don't know what I would have, right. you know what I mean? I had that in my back pocket. He didn't know it. I might have bought into that. I might have been scared, like, oh, I, I need a job. This is a good job. I don't want to, I, I wasn't going to leave it. This just had, came out of the blue, this today thing. I wasn't looking for work at all. Just the timing was like the, it all aligned, the stars aligned. And that's what it was. Yeah. I've never really been looking for something. It's always just happened. 
I think that's, I mean, that's, there's some luck in that, I'm sure, but I oh, think there's totally. something about the way that you are approaching life that it people, you're not, you know, clawing your way to the top. It's just, you're putting yourself out there and people respond to it. They yeah, like I it. think I am clawing my way to the top, but it's more like self-inflicted wounds, <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, can I do this type of stuff? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, yeah. So still it's also, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to knock this business because I've met some of the greatest people, my mentors, um, Howard Stringer is the first one of all. He was with CBS news. He mentored me back in the day when I started, he used to review my scripts and, and, uh, and back then actually there were very few women and the women were so pitted against each other, uh, that, you know, it was, it was, it was really awful, this threat that if you don't get the job, some another woman will want it. I, I never had an enemy among the women at all. I always felt there's power in numbers. Um, but, you know, it, it was a different time. So my mentors almost exclusively were men. that just weren't women in positions of power, women who really sometimes wanted to help other women. Uh -huh. That's why I make a big point to help other women, because I know what it felt like to be alone. But I, but I certainly had tons of people along the way that helped me and so many wonderful, wonderful people in the business that every day go there to do a great job of informing the public and they, they really believe it. It's not jaded. It's, it's their, their calling. Well, that's, they say that too, right? It's all about the people who are yeah, standing totally. behind you and with you and pulling you up um, yep. to the places you belong, which is amazing. So. Yeah. That's that's all that. So, um, what an interesting life you have. I'm like, I just love it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna close with my usual question. I have to tell you that it oh, is God. inspired by none other than Barbara Walters. <laughs> ah, I don't know if she asked this regularly or not, um, but I did. I remember seeing an interview that she did once, and I was like, I love this question. So maybe you can tell me if you've heard it or if she said it regularly. Okay. It's pretty basic. Um, <laughs> so it's two parts. The first part is, what do people I'm now I'm losing all my words. Um, what's the image that people have of you? Do you think, who do they think Meredith Vieira is? That's the first one. I'll go, come back to it, repeat it. So you don't have to think of everything at once. Okay. And then the second part is who are you really? And I heard Barbara say, this is how Barbara would have said it. Who is Meredith Vieira? So two parts. Okay. First part is what is the image that people generally have of you? Who do they think you are? I think they think I'm a, a, a nice person and an approachable person and a kind person to others. And who are you really? That kind of is who I am. I had good parents. I think they raised me right. And I think that that's not such a big deal to be. You know, that's kind of just being a human being, the way I look at it. But, but I still am a cool character. Just let me you know. I still am a kook. <laughs> I believe you. I'm a softie too. I think people, you know, maybe they don't know just how much I, um, how emotional I can get when I think about stuff. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing, but um, I feel deeply, but I can feel deeply for an ant that I step on. I can feel deeply about what's going on in the world. I just feel deeply about things. That's so interesting. So when you get emotionally, so you, you people don't realize how much how emotional you can get. So I think if they ever saw I mean, I could be a basket case because I, I think I am a very emotional person. I feel I feel a lot and sometimes I feel more than I should, you know, like I let stuff get to me. Um, and more so since having kids, because I, I'm always worried and I'm always worried. Um, but that something's going to happen. And I don't verbalize it, but it's internal. It's, you know, I don't call my kids every second and go, are you okay? I just want to know you're okay. But I, um, but I think about that stuff a lot. Uh, and by the same token, my son got married in September and I was a basket case for that because I full of joy that I, I just can't even hold that stuff in. It was just out pouring out. And so that, I, yeah, I don't, I think mo people know I'm emotional, but maybe not to that extent. And I sometimes hide it with humor and sarcasm and things like that. Okay, so was that the real Meredith Vieira? Did I get there with her? 
Did we connect? Let me know what you think. Drop a comment below and uh, give it a like if you like this talk. Remember to subscribe to Really Famous so you can catch all of your favorite celebrities on a totally different level. Tap that notification bell so you are notified every time I drop a new talk, which is usually every Friday and Tuesday, so about twice a week. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. That always helps. Thanks for hanging out with Meredith Vieira and me, and I will see you next time.